Hey everybody, Nick Espinoza, your chief security fanatic here, and today I'm actually asking the question, should teen social media posts disappear as they age? And I think this is actually a really interesting conversation to have. Now, this is, this is inspired from a Washington Post article that had this as its subtitle, but I'm mostly talking off the cuff here. I really didn't take notes from the Washington Post, and usually I look this up in multiple sources if I'm talking about something like a colonial pipeline, uh, you know, to bring you accurate information, and I'm cribbing from one, but this is for the most part off the cuff. And the reason being is that this is something I think I've been talking about for quite some time. But this article really brought it, I think, in my mind to the forefront of a possible way uh, to deal with this. Now, if you know me or follow me uh, in any which way on these videos or podcasts or, or, you know, even in real life, I travel oftentimes, other than COVID, uh, I travel very extensively to get on stage and, and talk basically cybersecurity, privacy, risk, trust, all that kind of stuff, uh, pretty much around the globe. And one of those things that I talk about, especially if I'm if I'm educating or I'm teaching about uh, online safety for the family, parents with kids, and all of that, when I'm when I'm with a crowd of parents, I'm usually saying something along the lines of, "I think we can all agree that when we were in high school, we were beyond thrilled to not have cameras in our faces as we were doing the stupid antics and stupid things that teenagers inevitably do." And that always gets a laugh or a chuckle, or I see a lot of heads nodding, like, "Oh my God, I was completely insane in high school," and I'm so glad there's not a video record of it. It. But kids today don't have that luxury. And kids today are now growing up. They're graduating college. They're getting jobs. They're entering the workforce. But they seem to have this indelible mark that is their social media on there. And the example that the Washington Post gave, and I will use this from the Washington Post, is Alexi McCammon. Now, you may not know the name, but I'm sure you might have heard her story uh, that made the news a few months back. She's known or was known as a rising star of journalism. She's a young African-American reporter who contributed to uh, NBC and PBS and actually made it onto the Forbes 30 under 30 list. But that didn't matter much this past March when after she was appointed editor in chief of Teen Vogue at age 27, basically uh, tweets that she had 10 years earlier that were considered racist and homophobic resurfaced. And obviously when the readership and the staff found this out, they revolted. And I think in something like less than a month, uh, you know, basically she was she was fired. I did not go and look at her tweets or anything like that. But that example is set and I do remember that from there. And that is essentially what we are talking about here. At 27 years old, are her views the same as they were at 17? Humans have the ability to evolve, to change their views, to understand, uh, you know, that that what we believe, let's say, a decade ago or 20 years ago or however old you are, maybe isn't isn't the view that you hold now as you gain more experience, as you gain knowledge, as you interact with the world and see how things work or don't work. And I think that's something that 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 needs to be understood now. I don't know Alexi, um, Alexi McCammon personally. I don't know, like I mentioned, the tweets that she actually had. I also don't know the society or the area that she was brought up in that may have influenced her in some way, shape, or form. But are her views the same as they are then? And if they're not, if she has genuinely changed those views and it, it bears out in, let's say, her posts in the last three to five years, do we penalize her for something that she did as a teenager? Now, Bill Maher, the comedian... Uh, you know, you love him or hate him, whatever wh whatever you think of him. And I don't often, I will, I should say, I do agree with him on occasion, and I do agree with, uh, disagree with him on occasion as well. He had something that really resonated with me. He does this bit called the final rule, or I'm sorry, the uh, new rules. And the final rule is always something about society and all of that. I don't always agree with his new rule about that, but he had one called the "What were you thinking?" generation. And essentially, what it was was a talk about how we are looking in today's society through this lens back at movies in the 1980s or even the Simpsons uh, who had a character named Apu that was voiced by Hank Azaria who was not Indian. Uh, Apu was obviously Indian and Hank Azaria apologized for that. And, and how can we as a society look back at that time because we didn't have that lens in that way? When Apu was created, it was perfectly fine. When, uh, you know, The Breakfast Club was created, uh, you know, by John Hughes in the 1980s, it was perfectly fine. And looking back at that now, we can say, yeah, what were we thinking? But it's not the same thing because we don't have the knowledge now that we did back then. And in 20 years from now, people will look at us and think, oh my God, what were they thinking? What, whether it's dress or, or views or anything else like that. You can even see it in politicians. Some politicians will basically take political advantage because the polling shows them that they should change their views, but some genuinely evolve. 
And so by virtue of that, as teens get older, as they start to enter the workforce, as they become productive members of society, do they need the stain of all the stupid things that they did in high school and as teenagers uh, basically following them around in this manner? I don't have that. I didn't grow up in that era. Many of you watching this or listening to this didn't grow up in that era as well. And I think it's a very important thing that we need to discuss as a society. Now, I believe in the right to be forgotten. I've done videos and podcasts and been on stage talking about the right to be forgotten, such as the European Union's GDPR that allows an EU citizen to go to a Facebook and say, basically, remove me, delete me. I don't exist anymore for you. California has a CCPA in the same manner. But when it comes to teenagers... How do we handle that? How do we look at that and say, oh, my God, like I was an idiot 10 years ago. I really need to delete that or have the right to be forgotten. Or should they simply age out? Now, the challenge that we have here, obviously, is that we can easily copy or screenshot tweets or Facebook posts or anything else uh, you know, that we're doing. And so these things can take on a life of their own, no matter how hard we try to scrub it. And so that's a very heavy ask uh, you know, to basically say, OK, Internet, collectively, these things are being removed. Is it a, an automatic digital rights management tagging or something? But then again, how do you get around the screenshots? I mean, there is so much that goes into this. So with that, I think it's a debate that we need to have. But I will leave you with this quote from that Washington Post article, which I think really underscores the problem and the dilemma that we have here. And I quote, social media's algorithms tend to amplify drama, promote hateful speech, and prioritize negativity. Although in real life, many parents would intervene so their children didn't say insensitive or bigoted things, the internet has evolved or devolved to simultaneously normalize invectives and demand moral purity, making it a particularly unforgiving environment. But how do we call out hate speech made by children without creating a culture of constraint? And I think that's a very important thing. And I think that also dovetails in with First Amendment arguments, meaning uh, we don't have uh, the right to not be offended, uh, but we do have the right to respond to, to negative things, meaning you can post any hateful, awful thing that you want under the First Amendment here in the United States, but that's not free from consequence. And so, so how do we tie this in, especially with teens that are learning, growing, evolving, and realizing that, you know, maybe what they're doing isn't necessarily the best thing. Unfortunately, they're realizing it a decade later. And please like, share, follow me here on Facebook and Twitter at Nick AESP. And please feel free to subscribe to me at YouTube as well. And as always, stay safe and stay online. Thanks, everyone.